Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, the supposed comfort, safety, and homogenousness that comes with living in suburban sprawl has long been satirized. But the new film, Greener Grass, by writing, directing, and starring duo Don Luby and Jocelyn DeBoer, take that satire to a surreal, brightly saturated, hilarious, and frightening degree. To explain the plot would be to miss the point. Suffice to say, kids with knives, baby swapping, children becoming dogs, and oh, so much more. Let's take a look at Greener Grass. Okay, Dennis, take a step to your left. Bob, let's see that smile. Don't you talk about my facelift! <clears throat> he doesn't smile anymore. Oh, I'm losing Twilson. If you could just rotate him forward for me, perfect. You were here first. I'm never a first. Julian, <laughs> what is he doing? Julian, are you a dog now? It's him. Oh, Julian, you need your glasses to see the board. I am Miss Cuban. I have Julian here. He's a dog now. Hi, Julian. Raja, you can play with Julian at recess. <gasps> so fast, it's incredible. Oh, that's who you were meant to be, my son. Julian's not invited back to Rocket Math. Do you think he was gonna become an accountant? Wait a second. Wrong husband. No, they do. Lisa, you kiss like your friend. <laughs> She's so cute. Lisa, do you want her? Are you sure? Take her. She's yours now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Enjoy. Would it be possible for me to get the baby I gave you back? I don't know, Jill. It doesn't hurt to ask, right? It did hurt. I didn't like it. Julian, wash up. Dinner's ready. No, it's not. Is everything okay? Oh my god, Lisa, you're pregnant? Oh my god! Jill, are you happy? I don't know. Maybe you should get a divorce. <gasps> yes! I have to get out of here. Out of bounds. Everybody, please welcome the incredibly talented Don Luby and Jocelyn DeBoer. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you. I, I'm Jocelyn. Yes. And I'm Don. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We're so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, congratulations on this movie, writing, directing, starring. Uh, it's an insane movie. It's incredibly funny. Uh, like the, some of the stuff in the trailer that is referenced by other critics, uh, it reminds me of a number of things that I've always loved, but I think it amplifies them to a place that we've never seen before. It's completely surreal, and you never know where it's going to go. How did the two of you start working together, and how did you know that you could write and direct and star together? And still be friends. <laughs> we're not, we're enemies. Yeah, we don't speak no, yeah. except in these situations. Got that vibe. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you um, for, for saying all that. That's so, so incredibly nice and generous. Um, Jocelyn and I met uh, back in 2011. We were put on a house sketch team together at yes. the Upright Citizens By Brigade. By force, yes. Yeah, yeah. We <laughs> didn't want to. No. <laughs> um, but that was when we first started working together as performers on this team. And um, about uh, six years ago, Jocelyn moved to LA, and then I followed about a year later. And we were kind of the only two people from our team that made the move. And uh, decided then to kind of um, start working together. And yeah, yeah I, I had always been like such a fan of Jocelyn's weird, weird sense of humor. And um, well, yeah. there is such a specific sensibility in this movie. And I think specific references that come along with it. How did that develop between between the two of you? Oh, yeah, I think so. Well, Don and I were both middle children that grew up, we still are, that grew up in the Midwest. And I think I, I knew, like, right when I met Don and started hearing the, her certain comedy pitches for sketches, that she was interested in exploring similar things to me, like... Uh, the kind of the drama and the mundane and domesticity and really satirizing kind of Midwestern things like a world of extreme politeness. 
and um, you maybe misplaced values. I guess that's universal. But yeah, I think uh, the very much that's where we found common ground. But we, we both grew up loving so many of the same movies. Like we're huge John Waters fans, of course. And um, actually, at the time when we wrote the short film version of Greener Grass, we were watching Twin Peaks. So. David Lynch, definitely an influence. And, um, yeah. The braces aspect of this movie, yes. where all of the characters in this suburban, is it a sprawl? It's not a cul-de-sac. What exactly is the community? It's, it's almost sprawl. like a retirement community in a way. Like That seems to be the setup, where it's like a retirement community for just sort of pr very privileged, bored uh, white people. Well, yes, it's very true. It's, uh, there are no cars in our movie. Everybody drives golf carts. And we shot it in a suburb of Atlanta that is, they call themselves the golf cart capital of the world. This is Peachtree City. And they have a hundred. Cool. Oh, right, yes, <laughs> very cool. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. They have a hundred miles of paved golf cart paths. It's a planned community, but for young families. So it's a it's not a retirement. It movie. is your movie. Yes. Yes. It wasn't much of a stretch. Yeah. So did you? I mean, when did you write it for there, or did you write it and no. then find out about that place and it, go shoot there? That. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a wild, wildly lucky that we stumbled upon Peachtree City as a location for. Sure. Where did you get the? I normally don't like asking this question, but I am very curious about the braces. Yeah. Like, where did you get the idea for the braces? Because as far as I do know within certain communities kind of like this, braces on middle-aged people have become a fad oh. and a trend oh. in some way. Like I've, I've, I've heard this and well, they're also always recommended by dentists now. It's the way that dentists make an extra bit of money is by being like, oh, your teeth are a little crooked. Maybe you get an Invisalign or get this sort of, get this thing that you need. Where did that come from for you guys? Why does everyone have braces? Oh, yeah. You know, the, the impetus was um, back when we made this short, we wanted something that right when people started watching, they knew immediately that this world was a little different. Um, and so we're like, if all the adults are wearing braces, that achieves that. Um, but then as we developed the feature and like really, um, and, and even later into developing the short, we really... Um, found that braces were the perfect symbol of this this thing where you, while you're wearing them they're such a mess and they're painful you have to have them tightened but it's you have it's a symbol of hope for future perfection and showing that I'm working on myself and um, also an element that everybody has braces, everybody's kind of competing with each other in different ways, right? So if one person in the community has braces, everybody else has to get braces in the same way that uh, I think there's a moment with, with divorce as well, with your character where her friend got divorced, so now she has to get divorced. Yes, exactly. Yeah, which I think is sadly a, a, a commonality in this, you know, type Large of... Large got divorced. I think I should get it, divorced it, it, now, too. It's true. I mean, my aunt, who lives in a very wealthy suburb of Minneapolis, said about that specific thing. She's like, that happened in my neighborhood. Like, one woman got divorced, and then two others did. So you're like, oh, well... I imagine that's just it. simply because they, the, the two others were like, oh, you can do that because yeah. I hate my husband too. No, it's like true. he's a prick. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that too. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> Less like your character who oh. doesn't actually want to get divorced. Yeah, yeah. Oh, girl. Quite yeah, anyway. she does not know what she wants. It's true. Did these yeah. two characters or this world develop simply for the short film, or was it something that you were developing as performers as uh, as well? It's so hyper specific. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it it really was just for the short film. And then uh, once the, the short film kind of took on a life of its own on the festival circuit, we started to get a bit of interest in developing it as a TV show. And nothing was more fun to us than imagining expanding the greener grass world. And we did work on it. We sold it as a TV show to IFC back in 2017. And we, you know, blew it out to be able to pitch six seasons of it. And then it didn't end up going. It was extremely ambitious budget-wise. And whatever was going on at the time, it, it wasn't right. And we were like, well, why don't we take the idea back and just focus on a smaller, more specific version of the story and do it for the feature? Was that difficult yeah. to sort of take all of the ideas that you had already created and sort of crunch them down into one movie? I feel like it was a relief. Yeah. Like, I think, you know, as Jocelyn mentioned, with building out six 
seasons. And this, with TV, you have to really imagine that it could go on indefinitely. And something about when we went back to make it as a feature, we started sort of by going back to the short and watching the short and it and being like, this is a, a simple premise. And it just seemed um, much easier in a way to tell it in 90 minutes versus um, who knows how many seasons. How do the two of you work on set together? Like, uh, you both wrote it, you're both directing it. Is there, is it the idea that you do so much in pre-production so that when you get on set, there's nothing that you disagree about and you pretty much are on the same page about everything? Well, yeah, you actually just said what Sorry. <laughs> we would usually I should have think. just left no, it no, open no, for no, you. No, please, no, I love that, but because that is what's most important. You don't want the department heads and actors getting two very different opinions, so we are always, like, we have to be the one vision together and I, I think we have an easy time doing that luckily so, um, it helps that we wrote it so we do a lot of our um, any budding heads creatively in the writing um, I would say and then by yeah. the time we've signed off on it to shoot it we're pretty um, very in sync yeah. How do you uh, butt heads while you're writing, and how do you deal with that? Oh, I don't butt heads is the right word, but yeah. just like, oh, I think, you know, yeah. it should be a dog. I think it should be an elephant. Yeah, and no. like, how was that an the actual disagreement no, anyway, in the not pool? <laughs> No, wasn't an actual disagreement to have him be no, an elephant instead of a no. dog? It was always a dog. But yeah. Which I, I love say, yeah. I love that the dog is also seemingly not a trained dog. <laughs> like maybe it is. Maybe that dog was actually had a trainer on set, but there's something like it's never really looking no. except for in close ups, it's never <laughs> looking in the right place. It's kind of just doing what a dog would do, which it's, I thought yeah. was adds to the like it being a child in this weird way yes we really wanted to keep that possibility open that this it wasn't and that it was a, maybe a dog and not like a, a perfect human in dog skin but it it is a seven month old puppy that we were shooting with and it was just so important to us that the dog was the same age as julian but in dog years so we, like, we, we needed a puppy and uh we really wanted that um, them to look alike and you, you know golden retrievers they start to look old and <laughs> how do you guys how do you guys pitch this to actors I'm sure you knew most of the actors that were in it mm -hmm. from the UCB world or just the comedy world but how do you pitch this stuff to actors because even on the surface the jokes themselves aren't extremely clear it's yeah. all about the tone and it's all about the world and I'd imagine it's about sort of teaching your actors a little bit about what exactly you guys are going for. So how does it work on the page? How do you talk to financiers and people and convince them of what, what this is? I, I think it was everything to us that we had made three short films. And I, I think because our style of comedy is um, so specific that uh, if, if the people had watched our short films, they kind of got it a bit like those worked for us in a lot of ways um and so we were lucky with the financing for the movie it came from someone who was already a fan of our work and was kind of like like yes get it go are. ahead yeah. yeah so but we do like to say that we did have complete creative control on this movie which to us was just invaluable in terms of making something unique and uh, that you were so grateful that we had that opportunity. <laughs> Um, I have to ask uh, your outfits today. Oh yes. How did uh, how did this happen? <laughs> well, we were like we're we live in LA now, but we're like we're going to New York. Oh, we got to look like New York. Like Yorkers. Out our vegan. Black. Leather. Look vegan like Marissa Black. Tomei <laughs> and my cousin Vinny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, we were trying accents. They weren't going well, <laughs> yeah. so we dropped them. <laughs> um, you know. I love we it. We just, uh, we've started dressing alike. We're becoming the same person. No. I think sometimes, like, uh, we're, you know, we're just peddling our movie now all over the world. And sometimes it, it feels so ridiculous and, you know, like, yeah. self-important in some ways that if we can do it somewhat in costume, we feel better. <laughs> yeah. Really it? I think that's a yeah. big part of it. Have you talked so, about this with each other? Yeah, we talked about each other. We, no, some, you know, um, it it helps us. Um, but do you get off stage after doing something like this and are like, oh, that was uncomfortable? <laughs> what can we wear next time so that yeah. I don't feel like I'm in my own skin? Yes, it's all we talk about. Yeah, how can we be more different? Than, no, um, 
Oh, what was the hardest part of uh, uh, of making making this film? I, I imagine it as being quite hard, and I could be wrong to stick to stay on tone, to know exactly how to be on tone all the time within the scenes. I, I that was of, of the utmost importance, and it was a constant conversation while we were writing, and then again when we were shooting, and then so much in the edit is like getting the tone just right. Uh, but I would say. Uh, it was lucky for us again that we wrote the movie and I feel like we had a really good inner sense of you know us being the calibration for the tone that I would say day to day it was just more really practical struggles uh, working with a seven month old puppy and babies yeah. and children it was a 19 day shoot in 17 different locations and you you know we can't show cars we can't show adult teeth without braces um, and it just the, the look the, was very ambitious what are the, the braces yeah. Actually, look like for the actors. Um, yeah, we worked with this incredible artist, Adam Bailey, who's based in Brooklyn, and he um, made similar to Invisalign, like he made a mold of all the actors' teeth and then built these clear, um, like Invisalign type of pieces, and then glued braces on top of them, so you could take them in and out. There's like always a moment, I think, specifically for people who work in comedy, who get shows or who get the chance to make a movie where you go, I cannot believe they're letting us do this and somebody is doing this for us. Did it feel like that when you were getting the braces molded to all of your actors' mouths? Were you like, I can't believe somebody is giving us money to do to get an artist to do this? Yes. Yes. So well articulated. This was our feeling about almost everything, too. It's... Uh, it. Yeah, we just were constantly looking around our set, being like, "This is our movie. Like, this is happening because it's." Um, we just dreamt of it so much, and you know. Um, within this sort of crazy world that we keep referring to as insane, there is a storyline of a of a sort of woman's spiral mm -hmm. uh, w within this um, within this culture, this cul-de-sac, if you will. Uh, when did you sort of decide on that as the sort of ongoing storyline throughout that it was going to be your character essentially descent into a different kind of madness than the mad world she already lived in? You know, that was actually part of the story, I would say, from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. And how do you we define madness in an already <laughs> fairly mad world? Yeah. Maybe sanity. Yeah, that, that is <laughs> actually... Joe becomes more sane. She starts to see the c cracks in this the perfect veneer of a world that she thought she lived in. Uh, yeah, at the, without giving anything away, because everybody should go see it. It's <laughs> playing at the IFC Center. It's amazing. But, uh, but within that, her moment uh, near the end is she seems to want to go back to it in yeah. some way. Or at the very least, there is a real love that you're trying to portray between her and Beck Bennett's character. Oh, yeah, that's a, oh, I like that, too. Like, I kind of yeah. enjoyed that. That was a moment yeah. between the two of them at the end where they kind of, they do like each other. Yes. In some, like, maybe more so than everybody else in this community likes each other. Right, yeah, I think that's true. Um, and what we talk a lot, of course, about, like, how we wanted the story to end. And it, so much of our movie is... Uh, uh, on the surface, like, uh, you, I, I mean, hopefully quite funny, okay. but then underneath there's layers that of really dark themes. And so we thought that it didn't seem right for the, you, the movie to end and just, like, tie everything up with a bow in this perfect way. But what we were more interested in is speaking to the cyclical nature of things in suburbia, where it is, I mean, I always feel dark talking about this, but it is a thing where it's like you make so much progress and then, like, uh, often you go back to what you know and um, there's well, not just suburbia. Yeah. I think that's kind of oh, uh, that's like life. Everybody like eventually has a meltdown, and then you figure yourself out, and you're yeah. like, okay, just get back into the swing of things here. I figured out my that meltdown, and then yeah. a year later, you're like melting down. You know, that's kind of life all the time. You're always sort of trying to solve the same problem. Definitely, and then we we're interested. Or maybe I am. Yeah, we wanted to speak to that, and also uh, at speaking to how the the things that we're writing about, of course, in it was like to us feels so specific to the p socio political climate that we're living in right now and the social media's effect on our generation and you know the generation younger than us etc 
But we really wanted to speak to these same things, these same like themes have been going on from generation to generation, and they just manifest themselves in different ways. Well, I like that the film removes social media and removes these sort of much more contemporary tools that we tend to blame all of our... Uh, Ex existential problems on, which is really not the case. It, true, and it's it, we did remove those tools, but it's the same issues of identity, how people establish their identity, and how much of that is by the things on their exterior and who they associate themselves with, and not actually what's inside and what you you actually want and who you are, and then also the misplaced values. And so it was so important to us that those are all still in the movie despite the tools being gone. Did you ever feel like you needed to after, right? I love the ending of the film. It's my kind of ending of a, a, of a movie. But did you ever feel like you needed to wrap it up? Did, were you ever hesitant or worried that you weren't wrapping it up uh, enough? Because it is a bold no, choice. Yeah. yeah, it just, I think, would have, we would have been getting off too easy. And I think letting down the audience. And if, if the or it just I think would be like oh that movie was just about nonsense or I I don't know I think like y this movie is all about um, c consequences of what seem like little actions like you know it was important to us when Jill gives her baby away that that we feel the consequences of that throughout the movie. And when Julian turns into a dog, that doesn't change. He's a dog now. And I think with with Jill's downfall and Jill's sort of character arc, you need to also feel the consequences of like her life up until then yeah. and her what a prison she is in. And she can't get out. Yeah, and it, and it's true that like the things that do seem so ridiculous, like a a woman giving her baby away, uh, are truly rooted in things that uh, sadly aren't that uncommon at all. Which is someone making a very big life decision in an impulsive way because of what they think will make other people happy around them. The careers people choose, um, deciding whether or not to have a baby, um, who you choose to marry. Uh, these huge life decisions can happen just like that and um, because of outside influences. And so that, um, yeah, it just seems, it would, yeah, it would seem wrong to us to not um, have a belly to the, the story. Right, it would have been like if you didn't have a, a belly to the story, yeah. if you will, or that through line and, an, and a, a gut punch of an ending, in a way, you would have had more of a... Uh, sketch comedy movie, which is exactly what this movie isn't. It's a very specific tone and world that is not built off of singular ideas going from scene to scene. But I will say too, we love to pontificate all about the deep theories in our movie and I, I will say too that it, we think it totally rocks when people have come and seen the movie and laugh their asses off the entire time and have no idea where Saturn like it's there's it's about anything else and so we're happy for people to watch it you however been, they enjoy. Uh, it. You've been going around peddling the movie at festivals. Yeah, and lots of peddling. Has uh, I have to ask? Do you John Waters is known to go to lots of film festivals? Have you shown him the movie? Has well, he seen the movie? Do you Are know you what? Try we. Oh, it's our desperate hope for John Waters to see the movie. Um, and we premiered internationally at this incredible fe festival in Switzerland called the Carno. And they were doing, uh, in like basically... A retrospective of his work. Yes. Like, uh, or like honoring him. And, and I think that's one of the reasons our movie got chosen to play there. It was this incredible venue. We, it screened in front of 8,000 people in the largest outdoor screening in the world, I think they call it. Um, and it, so we, we were just like all set to meet John Waters. And we were like, this is going to happen. And then we were programmed the first weekend and he was there the second weekend. So it didn't Bullshit. Happen. I know. I know. But um, yes, we, just, we so admire his work of course and particularly we talk about we we love that he's able to satirize these characters and this very specific place which is where he grew up similarly to us and but he does it with such respect for those people in the community and such passion and I feel like they're you it, love the egg lady and pink flamingos yes, you, love, like you love the egg lady yes and it's true with humor there's like 
when you, when you can actually satirize something in a way that is grounded in reality, there's a, and when you're from that community, you feel so known, and you feel like that that type of world is so known. And so uh, he was a big inspiration to us in terms of like we we want to make sure that we're laughing with the people from you know like where we grew up and not at a specific thing. And well, you always laugh from it. at or you always laugh with the transgressors in the Waters world. Yeah. You laugh at or you get upset by those who follow the status quo and are picking on or the antagonizing the, the transgressors. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, very much. Your character in some ways is the kind of the transgressor in the in this movie at the very least in the way that she is attempting to exit this world mm -hmm. at a certain point. Yeah, yeah. very much. Uh, we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who's a question? Hi. Hey. Thanks for coming to talk to us today. Um, it's looks super interesting and it's a very specific tone that like is super exciting to me um, as an audience member and I just wanted to ask you guys how like when you were coming up and writing the short and creating that how you found your creative voice together uh, yeah I think when you're writing a comedy it's uh, I, so much of what we do it truly is riffing all the time. And so one of us will kind of pitch something and then, you know, the other one like takes it and is like, well, what if this? And then, oh, that gives me an idea. And we're c constantly building it together. So I think uh, throughout making our shorts, that's kind of how our voice developed. Yeah, and we are people that, writers that do one million drafts and <laughs> where I can't even tell you at this point what ideas were Jocelyn's and which were mine because they're so intertwined and they've been changed so much through, I think we did 21 page one rewrites of this movie. Mm -hmm. And so I think just... 21 page one rewrites? Yes. yes. Wow. We, uh, we obsessively love writing together. It's like our, we have so much fun when we're doing that. But it's true from January of 2018 to May when we started to have a shooting draft, we, we did do 21 page one rewrites and we just worked every day. I would say it was like we clocked in at 8.30 in the morning and just like wrote all day long. And... Um, we like to say that too because I think it's uh, sometimes they, um, I think with comedies people think like oh you have to get it like really fresh like whatever is like so just on the top of your head and uh, kind of like with improv and we love improv like improv is one of my greatest passions but I don't think everything can just be improvised and then be a perfect movie it's like especially in this style like we you know had to have it pitch perfect in terms of getting the tone right and there's just lots of drafts <laughs> uh one more question hey um i was wondering what was your favorite scene to shoot and if there was a scene that was so hard because you couldn't stop laughing oh i love that question um, um there's a scene towards the beginning of the movie, and it's a very just kind of simple scene where um, Nick, uh, who's played by Beck Bennett, notices that his wife, Jill, played by Jocelyn, is wearing an underwear scarf, like a piece of underwear around her neck. And it's like a very um, kind of dramatic, like soap opera feeling scene. And it was one of the first scenes we shot. And it just, for me, I was behind monitor on that. And I couldn't stop laughing. Like, at, because it was this very serious conversation about underwear around your neck. And I, I just got excited. I was like, I think this is going to work. And when it's like early days on a movie like that, like we didn't audition Beck Bennett. We gave him an offer and we we had such confidence that he would be amazing. But those were some of the first times we ever heard him say the lines. And also it was, did you say our first day of shooting, right? Or it was, yes. it was so early too that we were kind of looking around at the crew to, 
just get a sense of like our you were gonna fire yeah oh too <laughs> well that too uh, here. but like how is this hitting is this funny and we saw that our sound guys who seemed like kind of very like older union men who like have done a million jobs were just like laughing their asses off and we were like is this like is this really happening and we kind of talked to them afterwards and they were like we don't know what kind of weird movie this is and at first we were like what what job is this but now we're like are we making the next napoleon dynamite and we we're like this is crazy because it, um, so that scene in particular i have all these memories of being like what are we making this is fun that's and like the cool. biggest vote of confidence you could get well, it's like your I, union crew guy being like this is funny shit <laughs> i know it was like the biggest so that was like so many feelings that day yeah. Um, I love the film. Congratulations. There's really nothing else like it, I think, <laughs> ever or out right now. Congratulations. Oh, Thank you so uh, very much. It's at IFC uh, starting tonight, right? We, uh, yeah, we're doing a sneak preview tonight. We're doing a Q&A afterwards. We're very excited. And then it comes out in New York and L.A. on Friday. Amazing. And then um, wider in the nation uh, November 1st and so we're hoping people show up this weekend because obviously the, the number of tickets that sell this weekend will determine if we can play in the Midwest where we're from so we're really you gotta show this in the Midwest <laughs> we, we gotta get or it to Minnesota or at the very least you have to do a screening of this at that Atlanta community that you yes, shot at yes we really yeah. do you, everybody has yeah. to be outdoor and everybody has to watch from their golf carts like it's a drive oh, like I it's a drive-in movie the best yeah. idea that <laughs> golf cart drive-in I love it <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for being here. Everybody give a huge round of applause. Thank, thank you, you guys. Thank you. Yeah.